Welcome to Inside New York's Art World. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and joining us today are two persons who have produced some of the most monumental, in scale, as well as in importance, pieces of art in recent times. Christo and Jean-Claude, his dealer manager. A warm welcome to both of you. Christo uh, is your given name. You are a native of Bulgaria who left almost 20 years ago. Can you tell us when and why you chose to leave that country? <laughs> um, I'm born in Bulgaria, but I'm also Czech. I live uh, in both countries, in Bulgaria and Czechoslovakia, until um, 56, late 56. The last time I was in Czechoslovakia in 56, and I um, passed the border in January 57 to Austria and Vienna. Uh, why I left Bulgaria on the East world, of other part of the world? Uh, no, it's, uh, it's many things. And of course, uh, before everything, I was very young. I was 21. And this type of decision was uh, most easily done. Um, I was studied the Art Academy in Sofia. And um, I was involved with architecture, uh, movies, and propaganda art. And of course, uh, that is my uh, youth and uh, mid 50s so during the Cold War and um, I learned during that time uh, about uh, Russian uh, Soviet art in the 20s through the same Soviet movie directors anyway you know I was uh, on the way deci my decision was um, important to happen exactly that time but because I was all going to Leningrad study official socialist realism or decided to go out to, to do something to my life, with my life. Uh, there was the Hungarian Revolution during that time, started in late September, and uh, all the board of Czechoslovakia was very perturbated with a lot of things. The, the army was, the Soviet army was on the border, but there was the uh, way of passing the, the frontier. And what was your way? Fa that is long story, but anyway, I was not official. I passed the border with 16 uh, people, mostly Czechoslovakian family. And I find myself on uh, January uh, 10 and 4 o'clock in the afternoon in Vienna. When did you first begin to wrap objects? Uh, the first uh, wrap groups, actually, what was, was, was this uh, object? They was called inventory. Or English word is inventory or invent inventory. 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 There was the group of uh, um, inventory is what you have proceeded to do for the last fifteen years. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, that in, in, invent inventory was like you were moving from your house, and you have the chairs, and you have the cases, and 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 all covered with cloth and fabric, and there was the group freely put together. And there was the numbers of uh, cans and bottles and all the materials, sometimes very small, about 20, sometimes large, about 40, 50 pieces. And they are all uh, a home, home object, you know, like object, and you can manip manipulate yourself alone. Uh, some large, perhaps the cherry table, that was the large, uh, uh, of course, that was the... Um, what was the first object, a bottle? No, there was, uh, I, don't know, I don't know exactly what was object, but there was a group of objects, and there was not one object. But there was the number of elements who was in my small studio, certainly it was chairs and bottles, or something that was directly manipulated by one man, you know, who was around. And stop being manipulated by a woman. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have always known the effectiveness of size. Obviously, that was one of the things that you early on learned from your propaganda art. Yeah. But the scale of your initial work, obviously... was small because, uh, you know, I was extremely... <laughs> I was in France. I was speaking very poorly French. I have no any means. I was living in a very small uh, place, and I have a seventh floor studio in a little room in, in 
and the service room in Paris uh, house. And of course, the only material was around me was very humble, small materials I can manipulate in that time or use for my work. But that was a very short time because I should tell you, already in 1961, in my first show in Cologne, uh, and uh, mm, uh, I did project inside and in gallery, but I did a very large outside dockside project in the harbor on the Rhine River and Kelm. That was the first yes, large in scale project in of the oil drums in and the also Cologne the wrappings harbor. and the wrappings. There was the huge amount of uh, uh, material of the dock, like. Uh, paper or rolls of the industrial paper who was wrapped in the massive, uh, I don't know, 18 to 20 feet high, uh, about 30, 40 feet long pieces. Now, the gallery was just in front of the harbor. It was very easy to do the piece inside in the gallery and outside pieces using the harbor sides and some ruin from the war remainings that was using like space to do project. One of the more successful art mergers in history. Along about what time did you become interested in Christo's art, Jean-Claude? The minute I fell in love with him. <laughs> but by 1961 and 1962? I know Christo since 1958. Mm -hmm. And were you involved in the oil drum uh, project? You mean in Cologne? Yes. No, I did not go to Cologne. I, we could not afford both trips. And after Cologne, where did you go? Uh, that, uh, the after that, that was the 1961, uh, I was doing the exhibition in Cologne, and they built, at uh, that moment, they built the wall in Berlin. And there was the very tension moment in Germany and Europe, you know, that was, I don't know if you remember, it was almost break of the world war. And, uh, the wall of Ulbricht was built in 61 in the, in the summer. And I come back to uh, Paris, and during that time, Paris was an incredible political uproar because there was the end of the Algerian conflict, and uh, all the street and all the all the Paris situation was extremely acute and political and um, motion of students, and it was very exciting. And I proposed in 1961 in September to build a wall of oil drums or iron curtain in the small street and and the left bank and Cartier, Latin Quarter, Rivers County. And I tried to get the permits very seriously. I did a photo montage and do some drawings and, and I start to ask the permits and the prefet and the government in Paris. That process was very long, almost a year. And I did the project in J June of 1962. I never get the permission. After that, we go to court and the police with Jean-Claude it was one of the long way starting doing projects with a lot of problems. <laughs> but all of your projects are not only <coughs> monumental in scale, but with costs to match. How do you go about raising the funds for something like this? What was the cost, for example, of the Valley Curtain? The Valley Curtain cost $850,000, and we never use the word raise because that is not the word that <coughs> artists use when they sell their drawings and works of art. They never say they are raising money, they call it a sale. And this is what Christo does through me. He sells his works of art, which are either recent for recent project or future project or old project or early packages. And he sells them through me, through the corporation <laughs> of which I'm president. Um, what is the corporation called? It depends. It used to be called the Valley Curtain Corporation. So each project has its own corporation. Now the Running Fans Corporation, yes. And uh, uh, the works of art are sold to museums, to art dealers, and to private collectors. And uh, the money is used to build the projects. I like Well, perhaps you might tell us in general how you select first the geography and then the specific site for any particular feat? No, it's really... Why uh, California? No, the, I think I'd like to talk about precise projects. You know, it's not, uh, they, each project is different. You know, for a long time, I was interested to do projects in California. For me, California was a huge fascination already in the late 60s. Perhaps this is the most American state uh, way of living. You know, the people live horizontally and, and very 
complex relation from urban, suburban, and rural life. And, and of course, through all that horizontal living, they have a huge uh, acute uh, notion about the land and use of the land, driving through the land. And uh, if you take now the Jerry Brown and uh, California legislation, they have the most high advanced uh, law restriction of land use and, and uh, working on the land. And this is why the project was, should be rooted in the, in the community with fantastically uh, acute and very nervous uh, relation to the land problems. And of course, this is the why... You like the, that edge of anxiety. No, but this is the, because the project, this is why the project was horizontal. And, the, and this uh, 24 and a half miles, mm -hmm. we're dealing with this three parts of la type of useless land. is basically east-west uh, acts related from a very r rural situation around the coast, going inland to suburbia and small town uh, California situation around the freeway 101. This is also is 24 and a half miles because I like to that the, f the fence was crossing very typical element of the California life, the freeway. The very busy highway of eight line highway. Now, all this was the all many, many considerations why we choose uh, the, the California. The same things when we were doing the Valley Curtain. There was many mountains in the United States. But again, all these projects should be done on a society, on community, where the people have very strong relation to their, um, their environment, their street, or their houses, or their mountains. And if you are aware, the Colorado is the most, <laughs> most uh, Colorado people in Colorado, they're most uh, uh, strongly attached to their mountains. They refuse to have the Olympic Games, the Winter Olympics, because they like to keep their mountains clean or mountains used. And the mountains was used in a very complex way between the farming and ranching and the sports. Now, all this uh, uh, situation was put, answer question why. I was doing this project in California, not in near Cape Town in South Africa, when some man, or some friend, on 50 miles. So um, then, the political and social context is as significant, or perhaps more significant, than the topographical context. No, they are all bounded together. You know, you cannot, <laughs> you cannot uh, avoid it that uh, uh, this type of situation in California. Of course, you can have it on 800 miles cross line, but I choose exactly this typical, specific situation. Same thing in, in Berlin, uh, the case of the Reichstag. The Reichstag is the only structure in that jurisdiction. But you cannot um, quali qualify some part more important or the less important. The most important part is the really the driving energy for the physical object. If the physical object is not ultimate end of the project. That uh, we will never arrive to this fantastic power of the project. Because you mean if you did not really intend to build it? Yes. You know, uh, it's very easy that the conceptual artists and conventional way, like all conceptual artists do, that going through that process of several weeks or months, and you have enough political and contra hearings, and I decided. I, I should finish the project. I learned enough about California, enough about um, international politics. If you were a conceptual artist. <laughs> yeah, a normal way. So that you reject an association with a traditional conceptual no. or earth artist. Yeah, exactly. This is the way. He rejects it. Absolutely. I don't think I'm anywhere an artist. Because the o final object is the ultimate end of the work, is, is like goal set it, and that is the energy. The work created fantastic energy for against the project the true energy, and that is the energy happened only because I pledge and I <laughs> uh, swear that I, until end I will go to do that work. Of course, that build up the antagonism, the forces, the committee to stop the running fence, the opposition of the, uh, the, the some Christian Democrat in Germany, and that created the fantastic uh, rolling machine against the project. But that is the, the force of the project, because they know that if the project is not arrived, the final object would be a failure. And I have many failures. And of course, the failure is very important, because the failure is the like cold shower. 
and the ego, very good to my ego, <laughs> and also it's very refreshing and it make, make you uh, see things and, and consider it and revise things and it's a very important activity. Yeah. All this project is outside of the art system. This is the very important things to be considered. Actually, the, all the art activity, including the all advanced avant-garde activity, they manipulate in the art system at all levels, through the gallery, art uh, um, uh, council of the arts, and New York State Council, the public grounds, reserve for art activity, uh, pledge to be art activity, things like that. Anyway, all that safe um, um, quarantine situation make art and the make-believe reality. What is important with the running fence or the rice stack or the valley cat and they are outside of that art system and they are thrown directly and the everyday life of the country of the community of the politicians of the army of the <laughs> circulation on the street and the highway department all these things and of course that is the, like teasing the system you know the, the system is all the way all the time teased by and system respond very seriously and that became the the humor of the project because the system responds very seriously. We go to court and you have the three judge discussing the fence in court. The <laughs> before, system before uh, the fence. Before the fence. Uh, While well, you were negotiating yes, permissions yeah. because of some of the opponents. Yeah. And three the serious judges are discussing something that doesn't exist yet. Yeah. <laughs> the question is the, uh, uh, the same way the system is teased in the government of California, the governor of. Jerry Brown and all the county and different departments organized in public hearings to the radio, television, and, and the newspaper, and the people arrive, and the people talk against, the people fall. Now, the, all that is the, how the, this work is done. And of course, that is the, the reality. Now, but ultimate goal, and that is the extreme, extremely important, is the irrational purpose of the project. And the that irrational. is irrational. Irrational. Called total irrational. Totally. Now, now this huge amount of energy, hundreds of people coming to the hearings, so thousands of people coming to the hearings, court trials, the only purpose of the running fence is not windbreaker, is not agricultural fence, is the work of art for a few days. And of course that, that logic to, come, uh, to be injected in the mind of these people, of half a million people, is a slow process. It's not happening right away. You know, it's extremely slow um, uh, melting process together, welding process together. And of course, it's almost like genera generator, grinding like that. And after that, it became so powerful that it's almost like crazy. And of course, this is why the politicians, and California was some of the politicians, was very upset because they cannot understand how 250 ranchers who are so pragmatic people can be involved with completely with no purpose. But of course, but this is, the, this is the, the magnetic power of this project because they have this incredible swinging around when the, it is electrifying and, and then there's no reason to have <laughs> hundreds of thousands of people running around and putting the fence. What do you really want them to see? Because you say you are 100% an artist, so yeah. there is something about their perception and something about their vision that I assume you okay. care about. Too. Okay, I, there was the enormous... Uh, uh, how's the um, imagination built of these three and a half years? You know, because the ultimate object was the fence, and through all these hearings and the court trial, the only things I can show with some sketches, some drawings, some photo montage, we really try to visualize the fence. <coughs> but, but the ranchers and the people who support the project and the people who was against the project also, they built some high-level <laughs> imagery, imagination, how the project here will look. And that is the really uh, was built uh, an, an, a dynamic situation because the fence was not existing. The fence was somewhere will be in the hills. And of course, because so many people was fighting against it, so many people fall, they start to build a vision how the fence will be looking in the hill. And of course, that is the, was one of the most important part of this project because it's this type of perception of art, there are no museum exhibition, no any graph old exhibition can develop this type of dynamic relation of understanding of art. You know, really, when the people and entire community is in the type of communion with the something who will become um, the ultimate work of art. Now, because that uh, process was slow, it's not right away, 
I remember when the fence was going up and we was um, 24 miles, it was impossible to take care about the huge amount of friends and people and some of the media. We asked simply the ranchers to become our press um, PR people. And the ranchers invited uh, TV people and journalists and the ranchers were doing press conferences in their land. They were telling what is the fence and how they were fighting for the fence and how was the fences. And the way the ranchers, was, for them the fence was his own project, you know, he was doing that for three and a half years. In the first public hearing we lost, not out of the opposition, we lost because the, <laughs> the supervisor was also not uh, quite sure that we should let us do the project. And we, and the January 20, 1975, we understand that we were facing incredible amount of very complex uh, <coughs> uh, opinion of people and, and politicians and... Did you think at that point that the project would not be realized? Ah, dear. I never think that, but there was <laughs> some very low <laughs> period of our time of exhaustion. You know, some of these public hearings was taking seven, eight hours. I should give you an example. Because the public hearings <coughs> built enormous media power, the, all the supervisors, congressmen and sublimen, was using them to be on the television. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, uh, they have the, all the television there and the newspaper, and of course, they were talking of the fence instead of talking about the schools and um, <laughs> building <laughs> kindergartens. And uh, they was on the front page of the San Francisco Chronicle and the newspaper there, and of course, they was on the view for the next campaign. And of course, all that made the project very untangled with the political issue, <laughs> who perhaps you think was not uh, relevant, but became completely part of the running fence by the sheer uh, importance, th because the politician was uh, vitally uh, important and gave us rights to the, the, the project. Well, let's go back to the whole question of monumentality. What do you think your work has done to the credibility of and the status of monumental works, uh, traditional, conventional ones? I always think that art in the 10th century was much more democratic than today. Because in that time, the people, nobody was involved with owning art, because the people owned the kings and the gods. And uh, there was the complete links, like for them the kings and gods was the same things, and there was the links directly with the art who was in that sphere, in that realm existing. But when art became commodity, uh, we start to own art and to share it, to share it, and to have it for us and <coughs> only for ourselves. And of course, that is the <laughs> that is all our monumentality start to be dropped in small pieces. You know, <laughs> we cannot have a monumentality when you are involved with the commodity, with transportation, goods, and all these things like that. And it's very sad to see that we're claiming that we're doing public art, but actually we're doing only bank, uh, garden objects and things like that around the town, around the city, on the places. They are not really profound relation. What is meaning the mon monumentality when was, and the, and the scope, what was practiced in the 10th century, during the building the Cathedral of Charter, or the, in the early 1st to 2nd century. And all that is the long, um, union of forces of energy and uh, is is i don't know how long we take until that our society understand that is capable to in lot energy if you like to call it or wealth or money or power that that power can be inloaded for for irrational purposes very important how do you plan to pursue the Reichstag? Well, it's the same way uh, as during each project. It's always uh, different people, different country, different customs, different level of society, and each time we don't know anything and we have to learn. <coughs> now that we are specialists about ranching, we have to learn about international politics, but we can learn, it's all right. And we have learned a great deal from the two of you. A very special thanks to Christo and Jean-Claude Thank you very much for being with us tonight. Yeah.